Welcome to today's um, YAL seminar. In fact, the pair of seminars, the first one by Christoph Jobs and co authors on bi objective optimization. Please, Christoph. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Christoph Jobs. I'm going to be talking about uh, bi objective MAPSAT and specifically uh, our bi -opsat algorithm that was worked together um, of me together with my supervisors. Um, that we presented in a recent paper at SUT this year. Um, I This presentation is based on, on my slides from there, from SUT, but I'm going to go through some more background first or some more... Um, some more basis, essentially. So I'm going to start by talking about by objective max SUT, what do we mean by that? Um, and then before going to our algorithm, I would like to talk about what we found to be the best performing algorithm we compared to, which is P-minimal, um, because I think that slightly more understandably translates directly from Maxa uh, and algorithms known from there. But then after that, we're going to be spending time on our biopsat algorithm um, and we're reusing ideas from single objective max up there, um, what we're doing there. So yes, we'll start by bioobjective max up, um, NP hard bioobjective optimization that we're trying to solve. Going to talk about notions of optimality there because that's not trivial for multi-objective or bioobjective optimization. And yes, gonna go from there. So why do we even care about bioobjective optimization? Well, I mean, I guess most of us know why we care about optimization. Optimization comes up in, in lots of real world or industrial applications where you don't just want to find a solution, but you want to find a solution that has minimum cost of some sort and an objective. Well, what we find is there's lots of applications where we don't actually just have a single objective that we want to minimize, but uh, we have multiples. For example, if we talk about interpretable classifiers, we both want them, a classifier to be accurate, but interpretability as a proxy, we can say means we also want the classifier to be small. And typically a larger classifier will be more accurate, whereas a smaller classifier more interpretable, but also typically less accurate. Same stuff we can say happens in solver portfolios. If we want to compare the two objectives, well, performance of the portfolio, but also we don't want to add 15 solvers to our portfolio. We have two objectives that are in conflict there. Network routing, there's stuff with uh, latency and um, what was the second objective there? I actually forgot, like, something with routing um, and supply chain optimization might be just cost concerns versus uh, environmental impact, for example, that might be in conflict. Um, so then the most obvious thing might be, okay, well, I have two objectives. What if I just add them up with a factor so that I can choose a trade-off? I get a single objective, I optimize over that. Well, the hard thing is, how do I find my trade-off in advance if I don't know how those two objectives look? Like, can I even, like, first of all, how do they scale? Maybe I can somewhat understand the scale of the two objectives in relation, um, but then still, like, how much more important do I find my one objective than my other one, actually? Um, so that's already a problem. And second of all, there is theoretical results of, even if you do this and you scan lambda through from, I don't know, the way it's written here, from 0 0.1 to 1,000, you might still not find all possible trade-offs in that range, even if you could scan every single value in there. So there's just it's theoretically not possible by scalarization to find all trade-offs. So the conclusion we're drawing from this is, well, MaxUp works there is a problem here that isn't tackled yet. So we're, we want to work on this. We want such based algorithms for by objective optimization. Let me go through an example um, of 
what this bioobjective optimization might look like. Um, and the example I'm going to go through is exactly this interpretable classifier thing I was talking about with a very simple type of classifier that is a so-called decision rule. A decision rule is essentially just a logical formula over a, a set of binary features. So it's just a CNF in, in our case. And we want to um, find a decision rule that is both small, therefore interpretable, uh, but also accurate. So if we look at a very, very tiny toy data set, here we have three different data samples uh, with two features and one class. Uh, so the output of our logical formula over x1 and x2 will give us the prediction of this classifier. Uh, then a rule might look something like, well, feature x1 and feature x2. If we look at our data set, this uh, first sample would be classified as one, which is correct. These two would be classified as zero, which is correct. So accuracy of this classifier would be perfect, 100%. Uh, and its size is two, if we measure in terms of literals that appear in the decision rule. Another classifier might be R2 here, which is just X1, which would correctly classify the first two samples, but incorrectly classify the third sample. So we have an accuracy of, what is that, 66%. Um, but it's more interpretable because it's smaller. So very tiny example of, we have these two objectives that we need to trade off. And it's not clear which one of these is better. If we say we only look at accuracy, then clearly, OK, our one is better. But if we want to consider interpretability as well, then it's hard to say. So yes, if we look at single objective optimization, something like Maxa, it's very clear what is an optimal solution, because we have a unique optimal cost value. If we have a solution with cost five, then that's, it's very easy to say, well, every other solution will have a single cost value. If that cost value is smaller, then that solution is better. If that cost value is larger, then it's worse. Um, but we still have possibly multiple optimal solutions. So there might be, if, if the best solution has an objective value of five, there might be 10 different solutions that have this objective. Now, if we go to multi-objective optimization, what even is optimality? As I was saying, like you, you have two objectives in bioobjective optimization. You have uh, one solution that's ha that has objectives value, objective values five and one, and another solution that has objective values one and five, which one is better? Um, we don't know if we don't give more information. So there is multiple different notions of optimality we can use for multi-objective optimization. One fairly easy thing to say is just, well, the first objective is the more important one, and I care about this um, in the first place. Essentially, that's just looking at your tuple of objective values and then lexicographically comparing them. And this lexicographic comparison is what gives you your ranking of solutions. And then you have, again, as um, a single optimal cost value, possibly multiple optimal solutions works. Um, that you can actually reduce down to a single objective problem if you select your lambda factor um, in the right way. Um, but for that, again, we need to know which of our objectives is the one we actually care more about. The next notion would be Lexi max optimality, which is something like, well, it's hard to, to exactly formulate correctly. So to properly spell out it's sorting your tuple of objective values and then lexicographically comparing. What that essentially does is something like you want to minimize the worst of your objectives. So as long as they're scaled in the same way, if all of them have a range from one to a hundred, you want to minimize the worst one of them, which is for some application that comes quite naturally. It actually does a bit more than that because it doesn't just minimize the maximum, but then the second maximum and then the third maximum. Um, do you have an example when this would be a, like the right thing to do? Uh, for example, you have four groups 
uh, that all have a somewhat a measure of how content they are with a solution. You could say a solution where um, where my first three groups are 99% content, but my last group is only 10% content. You could say that is worse than saying all groups are 80% content. Okay. Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then the probably or arguably most general notion of optimality is Pareto optimality, where you essentially just say something like, and I will go into more detail on this, every solution where there is no other solution that is obviously better is optimal. And why I'm saying this is the most general notion of optimality is because all the solutions these two consider optimal will also be Pareto optimal. So the, the optimal solutions, the set of optimal solutions under these two notions are subsets of Pareto optimal solutions. Now, what do I mean by obviously better than another one? Let's look at this here. So we have a bioobjective problem. We have an objective one and an objective two. We want to minimize both of those objectives. And we have solution that in this objective space map on those different points. If we look at tau one and we are minimizing, then we can say, well, tau two is better on both objectives. So tau one is clearly not optimal because tau two, everything that is in this upper right triangle from tau two is clearly worse. If we do this over all of them, we find, so essentially we're, we're blocking out this upper right triangle from all of the different solutions, we find that tau three and tau four remain. There is no solution that is clearly better than tau three or tau four. Then uh, we consider tau three and tau four for it optimal. More formally, this is defined as a different uh, as so-called dominance. So a solution dominates another solution if it is not worse on all objectives, and it is better on at least one. It's essentially this idea on like, okay, if something is clearly better, yeah, in, in exactly this situation, if it's not worse on all of them, but it's better on at least one of the objectives. And then the Pareto optimal solution is just a non-dominated solution. Well, uh, with this, we can now, well, okay, the, the formalization of the problem is actually independent of the notion of optimality, I guess. But uh, since we we want to sort of just take Maxat and extend it to this bioobjective case, we actually formulate the problem very similarly to Maxat. So we say we have a set of hard clauses, uh, F, which is just a sub encoding of our constraints, our situation. And then, well, if you want to talk about soft clauses or if you want to relax them with blocking literals and then actually have a set of soft literals, we're essentially going to say we have two linear, linear constraints, O i and O d, um, that we could map from, from soft clauses if we want to work with this. But it's easier in theory and in practice, actually, to work with literals. So our toy instance, for example, might look something like this. We have a CNF encoding of this cardinality constraint that at least three of our objective literals need to be set. And well, this is light of use of notation since this is not a set, but anyway. Uh, and then we might have two different objectives with three literals each. So this would actually map to um, uh, to the this shape of their these two solutions, for example, are in there. So we can have a solution with two of one of them. No, not quite true. Should not go there. Uh, that might be an instance. Let's stick with that. Um, so here, an optimal solution. If we say at least three of those uh, need to be set, might be well. We're setting three of one objective and zero of the other or then the other way around, or then two of one, one of the other, and so on. Yes. 
And with this, we can now come to our first algorithm. I just had a stupid question, but could it, like this, the way you set it up is uh, both objectives agree on which the hard constraints are, yes. but they're sort of weighing the soft constraints differently. The so they can they can also talk about completely different soft constraints. Okay. So I I have a set of hard clauses and I have soft literals, but these soft literals, like if we look at those two as sets of literals, the intersection can be empty. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was thinking about the other thing, like what if what if if you're the D objective, like you really care about Actually, you care so much about the constraint that it's hard. Although the uh, the other well, objective thought it was soft, but then I guess you can play with the size of the coefficient. If you want to do that. Well, if one sense. of the objectives considers it hard, it's just hard. Oh, okay. There is no hard for one objective. Okay. So you can set those. Well, you could, wait, I mean, if you're doing lexicographic you, you can't set the weight horrendously high, but then you will still get a solution potentially yeah. that doesn't satisfy it. Mm -hmm. That is, so what we'll, what we'll see in a second is, um, well, actually, the, don't define this anywhere, but you, you get this Pareto front of multiple solutions with different trade-offs. And there might be then one last solution that still doesn't satisfy this, this constraint with a really high weight. But basically, you're saying that what, what I'm asking about doesn't make too much sense. Uh, we well, think yeah, if it's completely hard, hard constraints, hard. And then you're just different soft constraints that you care about, or or at yeah. least like different coefficients, maybe you. Yes. Yeah. But no, that we could share you know, the objectives could share literals, but they're Thank weighting you. them differently. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we have one. So one of the uh, benchmark domains I will be showing later on does that mm -hmm. essentially. So first algorithm, which is p-minimal. That's not our work. That is a paper that is in the references. P-minimal, I am somewhat thinking about as solution improving search for multi-objective, for multiple objectives. Um, so this algorithm is not specifically by objective, but extends to n objectives. Um, yes. Uh, what I'll be talking about later only works for two, or at least for now. <laughs> so um, we have a single SAT solver. We initialize the SAT solver with our hard constraints. Um, by this, we're somewhat just setting up, okay, we need to satisfy this. Um, and that's all. Uh, and I'll be going through the algorithm here in the flowchart while at the same time, in this, again, objective space plot, I'll be mapping out the search the search trace in objective space. And what I've grayed out here is what will assume the hard constraints allow us to uh, permit us from, from having any solution in. So this is like our border of, of what is reachable. So this is the infusible space making tau one and tau two o here optimal parental optimal solutions that we want to find. So we're we're looking for these two things and I'll now be stepping through the algorithm finding those solutions. So what P minimal does is it starts by just making a soft call without any assumptions with nothing, which will give us a solution that is anywhere in the feasible space. And now if you think about solution improving search, what it will do is it will add a constraint saying, well, give me a solution that is better than that and then resolve. That is essentially exactly what um, P minimal does, but in two steps somewhat. So from this model that we find, we will find BI and BB, which are the bounds on objective I and objective B. I and B here don't make too much sense. Actually, uh, I'll get to for our algorithm, I and B have a meaning for here, just treat them as 
could replace them at one and two. Um, what we'll do is we'll add a clause saying that either our next objective value needs to be better than bi for the i objective, or our next objective value for the d objective needs to be better than od. What this does is it blocks away exactly this dominated upper right, um, not triangle, this upper right square, uh, and permits us from ever again finding any solution that is dominated by what we have right now. If we would now just solve again, we would still not have a guarantee though that this new model that we find, this new solution, will actually dominate this tau, tau 1c that we're at right now. So we won't solve without any constraints, but we'll solve under the assumption that both of our objectives will be uh, not worse. So essentially, what we're saying, if we look again at the, at the definition of, of Pareto optimality, if you think back, what this right here is telling us is we're not worse on any objective. And what this clause is giving us is we're better on at least one. So together, these two constraints together will force us into this uh, lower left rectangle. For example, we might jump to tau 2c here. And we have a new model. So we get a new bi and a new bd. So we just do this again, um, which might leave us here. We are again blocking the top right. Um, and we're now, we're at tau 2o. If we're now solving again, under these assumptions, uh, then we'll get unsat. And if we get unsat, what we know is we found a model where no uh, no other model exists that dominates this solution. Uh, yes. So at that point, we can just return this solution. Um, Potentially, at this point, there might be multiple solutions. If we're interested in all of them, we can do an enumeration loop here. Um, but that's essentially depends on the problem if you want to actually do that or not. Um, yes. With solution improving search for a single objective, we would be done now. We found our optimal value. However, for multi objective optimization, there might not be a single optimal cost value. So we still want to find this point, which is why we just repeat this entire loop. And that's why these are clauses here, like they still exist uh, and they still block, like what we block from tau C1 here, we won't find anything in here. We go back here, like all of this still remains blocked. So, with this next free sub call, we'll be anywhere here, um, which might mean okay, we jump here and then we do another iteration and we're here. And once we find unsub here, we again return everything. And now, if we're out here and without any assumption, we get unsub, we know that we've actually found all the first optimal solutions. Or, well, yeah. So the search rates look something like this. We're, we're Essentially, we're going toward one for the optimal value, but we're doing this multiple times. And there is no guarantee about, so there might, of course, be a lot more than two different objective combinations that we can get to. There's no guarantee on the order we're building in those in. And in practice, what do you see? Uh, it, it jumps back and forth. It's wild, yes. Yes. So essentially, this inner loop right here is somewhat just solution improving search. We need this outer loop because there are multiple optimal objective values. Um, and if you do this for a single objective, you have solution improving search for max. Which is why I'm thinking of the minimal as 
solution and borrowing search for multiple objectives. Yes. Now, yes, we have an implementation of this um, that we've or that I've implemented to compare our algorithm to. It works with a single set of instance, so nothing of like two objectives you need two set solvers. Now we just have a single set solver implementation in C. Um, originally, they're working with the order encoding. We need we use totalizers over the two objectives, so we have two separate totalizers. Um, yes. How does it work? Well, I'll show a couple of these plots essentially, which is CDF plots. So runtime number of solved instances, and we have three different benchmark domains. These two are set covering where every um, element in our sets has two different weights. So in that moment, we have the same literals in both objectives, just they have different weights. And here we have learning decision rules on an encoding that exists. Um, essentially the example I showed earlier for different um, machine learning benchmarks. These are two other competing algorithms. I'm not going to go into detail on those. Um, Seesaw doesn't actually work for those benchmarks. That's why it's not showing up. Pareto MCS does badly here, solves zero here, which is why it's not showing up. And P minimal does this, which by now you don't have any reference for. It's all stuff. I'll be adding more lines to this later. So yes, it's doing quite well compared to those two. Now for our idea. Um, so we're now transitioning from the minimal, which was previous work, to bioxat our algorithm. Um, and I'll be doing essentially exactly the same, stepping through a flowchart here, mapping it out in objective space here. What our idea was is well, we can essentially the idea is to go along this Pareto front here in a specified order. Um, and that is why those two objectives are called OI and OB for increasing and decreasing, because we'll see, we'll enumerate the optimal solutions in increasing order following this objective and in decreasing order following this objective. So what do we do? We again, we have a single sub solver. We initialize it with the hard constraints. And we initialize two bounds, the i and the b, again, um, one with zero, the other with infinite. So essentially, one, um, yeah, the, the zero is essentially just a, don't care about this in the beginning, infinity is not a constraint. Um, we'll start by calling our sub solver under the assumption that OD is smaller than, well, infinity, so nothing. Uh, so essentially, in the beginning, we call it without anything. We'll hopefully get a model because otherwise we can't solve anything. Um, and we'll be somewhere again. And now what we do is we call a subroutine that minimizes only over this increasing objective. We minimize over all i under the condition which is at the moment empty because this is infinite. So we'll just find the minimum for the increasing objective which we'll assign to bi. So essentially what we're doing is we're going as far left here as possible. And then as the next step, what we'll do, and by the way, this is not guaranteed to be on the trade line here. This might go up, this might go down. We don't know. Then we do a second subroutine that minimizes over the decreasing objective under the condition that the increasing objective stays the same. And by this, we just go straight down here. And now we know we're at the Pareto optimal solution. We either return it or enumerate all, and we repeat. And now this constraint actually is important because from here we assign BD. So we actually have a value here now. Now this is a constraint and this is what forces us to be somewhere here. And then from here, we'll start again, minimize, minimize. We'll minimize over the increasing objective. We'll minimize over the second one, which in this example doesn't do anything. Um, 
will return and so on. And when we're here and we don't get a new model, we know that we're gone. That is somewhat the skeleton of our biopsy algorithm. Now we still have these two subroutines that I haven't talked about. And this is essentially where will now be interesting. So at SAT, I got the question, well, the difference to be minimal is we're forcing to enumerate in a specific order. Very often to force a solver to do something specific rather to let it do, let it go wherever, is not really a good idea. So why is this better? Well, we'll see what we actually can do in the, in the subroutines. Implementation details first. Again, single SAT solver, radical, same as with the other implementation, actually. Um, we make use of incremental totalizers here, essentially the same idea, C++, open source as well. Um, so we have these two subroutines. We have minimizing and we have solution improving search. So you might already guess, well, solution improving search always does what the name implies, solution improving search. Uh, and that is because while lower bounding search might be possible, but we have constraints that will get um, tighter and tighter from the decreasing objective. So we would essentially always start from zero. We, we never know, we look at this plot after, so if we do this search here, no, sorry, we're talking about the second one. We are talking about the yellow arrow. So we do lower bounding search here. So we would come at this point from the bottom. The next time we're here, we don't know how far down we need to jump. So essentially we will start, need to start from zero again and come up at this again, which essentially, yeah. With, with solution improving search, we have the advantage that we can continue going down from the top further because we're guaranteed to be decreasing for this objective. Yes. Put in another way, if we would want to do core guided search, we loosen constraints and on OI. And if we loosen constraints, we might invalidate cores. That's why we couldn't keep reusing cores from core guided search. Um, so yes, we do solution improving search by maintaining a totalizer over all of it. And now for the minimized ink subroutine, that's where the interesting stuff is going to happen. Uh, I'm going to talk about five different variants we have for how to implement that. The first one being, well, sudden set solution improvement search. Same idea, we have a totalizer over everything. Um, we have a single assumption then to enforce this thing. And this will give us a search that looks simply illustrated something like this. Um, so we'll do solution improving search on the first objective, then solution improving search on the second one, jump to the next level, do the same thing again. Minimize ink in sub ansat in solution improving search looks something like this if we want to go uh, into the details. So we have two separate assumptions here. This is the assumption that needs to hold for minimize ink in general. We have this input of the bound on the decreasing objective. So this will never change. This is just an additional constraint that needs to hold for the entire subroutine. Uh, and that is the constraint that by updating tau will get tighter and tighter and drive down tau object. And if we're unsub, then we update our bound. Then that's exactly the same picture, just the other way around. And to um, for solution improving third, We'll have, we have this constraint that OI has to be equal to BI. We actually enforce that it's lower than or equal. We know that before by minimize ink, we found the minimum. So enforcing that lower than or equal will actually enforce that it's equal. Um, and this is the solution improving such constraint that actually drives, well, yes, with this one actually drives down. This one is what drives to the left in my illustrations from before. So that is essentially the instantiation of our algorithm that is the most, well, that does solution improving search on both. So in a sense, it's still very similar to P minimal. Um, so how does it compare in performance? I've 
cut the access here by now. This is why the other two comparing algorithms are gone. Um, this is what we see. On the decision rules, already with this variant, we're better, but it's all pretty tight. If we put the other ones in, then these two are like almost one line. Um, here we are a bit better. Here we are the, virtually the same. Well, but now the interesting thing is we can actually change this minimize ink subroutine. For this one, we can reasonably, reasonably go to lower bounding search. Um, and lower bounding search means, well, we can do different things. We can just do sub, uh, unsub, sub search, um, which we're trying. It's one of the um, alternatives we're doing. Um, but the more interesting ones are the two four guided variants. We can do MSU3 and we can do all of that for this objective now. Um, yes. All of these variants somewhat, no, the first two remain one big totalizer as well. That is in both cases incrementally built to what, actually, what we actually need. OLL does what OLL does and maintains small totalizers. Um, over course that are um, not merged into one big thing or anything. And then while well, lower bounding search is hard to illustrate because you don't have candidate solutions, you find because you just have unsat calls, but somewhat from below, we find something, then we do solution improving search on the other objective. And then somehow we either through core guided search or through unsat stuff search, we jump to the next one. In more detail, in unsat sub, we get a bound on the i where we start from. In the beginning, this will be zero or minus one, so that this works. Um, and the bound on the decreasing objective. Again, this is our external constraint that just needs to hold for the entire subroutine, which is this. And then we just increase this bound by one every round until we get stopped, and then we have our bound. Um, Yes, this is just normal unsat sub search, which is from max that known to not be that great, which is what we see as well, somewhat. And then MSU3, I will, well, it's, I, I tried for a while to illustrate it, gave up on it and used to the book. Um, it, essentially, we're, we're doing the same idea, but we're using information from unsat here that we then only add to the totalizer. So we start by no totalizer, we start by we have this uh, set of active objective variables. If they are not active, we enforce them to zero or to false. Um, and then we slowly start building up our totalizer. <laughs> what MSU3 would be doing in Maxat plus this constraint essentially, which is here in slightly different notation. So, um, no. Uh, yes, the idea assumption here. That's the, the assumption on the sub. And then, yes. Yes, now we can again look up the performance of this. And now I'm going to be adding all, all variants at once. We have MSU3, unsub subs, and OLL. And if we add those, uh, well, for the decision rules, actually, these are all the four different variants for our biopsy algorithm. They're all very similar, but better than p-minimal. Right here, we see that OLL performs badly. And actually, still in this case, that answer is the best variant. But over here, we see that MSU3 performs quite well. And now, by looking at this, MSU3 does well on these. That answer does better on these instances, um, plus actually looking at the details of what our search actually does, we've realized, well, there is one difference actually between what we are doing plus normal max out search. And that is what we are doing in this minimized ink the first time is a normal max out iteration, essentially a normal max out call for MSU3, for example. But then the second time round we arrived there, we just continue running MSU3 from where we left off with uh, tighter constraints and try to find a new optimal. 
And if we do this many times over, what essentially happens is, well, all our literals will become active at one time or another. And if we run MSU3 with all literals being active, it's actually unsets up. Because you have no assumptions anymore, you won't find meaningful force. So all you're doing is increasing the bound by one every iteration. And unsets up does not do per, um, specifically well, so our performance just suffers in this case. So instead of running unsets up at that point, why don't we switch over to self -unsets? That's the idea behind our last variant, which we called MS hybrid, so MSU3 self unsat hybrid. As soon as a certain percentage of our variables in our objective are active, uh, then we switch over to self unsat. If that is not the case, if not that many are active yet, then we run MSU. And by that, the idea was to combine the advantages of MSU3, meaning we don't need to start with a full totalizer, but we slowly build up our totalizer as soon as we need it. But as soon as we have the full totalizer, then we can also just run our answer. Yes. How does performance look of that? Hopefully we'll see that it's somewhat similar to that answer here, but similar to MSU3 here, what do we see? Well, we do actually see that it's even better than MSU3 here. And I guess it's better than Sadansa here as well. And here, everything is just very similar anyway. Um, yes, that's essentially the main results of our five different variants of our Biopsat algorithm that we have. Um, okay. Question. Yes. In the hybrid mode, if you uh, would just take two stalwers, run them in parallel half the time, and if one of them gives you the, oh, maybe you can't do that. I like, I'm trying to figure out whether do you do, like, does the hybrid mode somehow, is there any interaction? Does it help, or, or could you just run two stalwers in parallel for half the time? The well, the idea is, so we don't need to reset the sub solver or anything. Yeah. So we run on one sub solver in MSU3. MSU3 incrementally builds up a huge totalizer. Yeah. As soon as that is full, we just switch over to sub answer. So they never run over the same problem. We just continue the search that MSU3 left off in the middle. And now we start sub answer in the middle. Oh, okay. So they Salanza so doesn't start over from the beginning. It just continues off where we stopped them. That's so, so you won't uh, and once you've started doing sat on sat search, you're not gonna go back. No. Okay. But it wouldn't really I mean I guess we could go back, but then we can also go back to unsat sub because we already have to. Like all of our literals are active, so MSU3 is not going to find any cores, any meaningful ones, except for, well, our totalized outputs will be in the cores, but you throw those away for MSU3 anyway. Um, so, yeah, what we could go back is to Sadansat, but what we see typically where is Sadansat? Yeah, Sadansat just doesn't do very well, so we don't actually want to go there. Uh, Ansatsat, I think, right? Start on. Yes. Well, once you have total as a field, could you like do binary search for that optimal or? We could, yeah. I mean, we could just do binary search as another variant. Yeah. I think in my initial proof of concept implementation, I tried it and it didn't really work well. Yeah. It's not implemented in that version. Yes, you could. Yes. So I have some more time, so I'll show some more data and some optimizations that we did to the algorithm. Um, yes, scatter plot, how does Biopsat in the best variant, so as MS hybrid, actually compare to P minimal if we look at it instance by instance. So we have the run the runtime of Biopsat um, on the x-axis of P minimal on the y-axis. The diagonal is equal runtime. 
we have a log scale. So this is um what is that? That is why that takes twice as long, and that is the minimal takes twice as long. Decision rules for most of them were yeah, roughly in the two times as fast range, maybe for this cluster right here or so. Um set covering these by the way are two different ways of generating random instances. So these are real world instances, these are randomly generated. Um yes, uh, looks similar. Uh, and especially for these types of set firing instances, we are quite a bit better. And I'll go in a second what that is due to. Yes. Um, so that is how they compare. Here is some more thoughts. What should I put there? Um, so yes, as I was saying, Biopsat does restrict the subs of them more. However, due to these restrictions, we can do things like lower bounding search and hardening of the decreasing objective as well. So instead of just doing that as assumptions, we can actually add it as unit clauses because we know they will be able to only get tighter, those constraints. Um, and that's also why Biopsat is somewhat limited to two objectives because this stuff you can only do for, for lower bounding search, you can only do for the first uh, of your objectives if you would want to scale to multiples. Um, and hardening, I think you could maybe do for the last one or so. I haven't fully thought this through, but it gets tricky if you want to add more objectives. You probably couldn't even do it for the last one because you don't have a strictly decreasing objective. You still have one that is strictly increasing, but none that is decreasing. Yes. Um, what I mentioned a couple of times is that um, as soon as we've reached one of those, what we call Pareto points, like one of those points in the corner where we don't find anything dominating anymore, we can either just return one solution and continue, or we can then enumerate all of the solutions that have the same objective values. Um, and we've tried this, so we have both modes implemented essentially. Um, and if we compare the runtime for these decision rule instances, we see that enumerating all of them can hurt us quite badly. That is mainly due to there being thousands of instances at the same Pareto point. Though. So enumerating them will take time. That should not be terribly surprising. If we look at the set covering instances, however, where most often there's only a single solution, then doing that doesn't really hurt performance either. So that is that is the good news, essentially, if you want to know if there's more instances, you can run enumeration. And you can, of course, also run enumeration for a maximum of 10 instances if you just want to know is there multiple instances there. Um, yes, we've implemented this both for BIOS and for P-minimal. P-minimal, the story is similar. I don't have the plot here. So, you can actually do it in reasonable time. Really depends on your instance. And if you want to do it, of course, depends on the question you want to answer. Now, let me briefly go over some refinements that we've done to the algorithm. Um, for these enumeration cycles at a Pareto point, you will need clauses that block the solution that you found last. And then you just solve again under the same constraints, you find a different solution for that again, and so on. Um, so what we can do is we just naively block over all of the variables. But depending on the encoding, this might give us symmetric solutions um, that we're not actually interested in. So for these decision rule instances, for example, and for set occurring to some extent actually as well, we use domain-specific blocking clauses for this enumeration set which actually for the decision rules is necessary to even make enumeration feasible because the encoding just has so many um, symmetries that you can just skip over by these shortened blocking clauses that block what you actually want to block, which is the sort of, if you have multiple sub solutions that map to the same real world decision rule, you're only interested in the enumerating the decision rule and not necessarily in enumerating all of the solutions of the CNF. And then the other thing 
I've talked about with these lower bar, uh, lower bounding search techniques, we incrementally build the totalizer on the increasing objective. However, we're always doing solution improving search on the decreasing objective. So for that, we need to build a totalizer in the beginning so that we can enforce bounds on this. However, now we come back to the, are these objectives overlapping or not? So are the objectives over the same literals or not? If they are, and we are doing core guided search, and we are, uh, and a literal in core guided search is not active yet, then that means this literal is assumed by an assumption to the subsorder to zero or false. So we know it can never be set in the other objective either. Um, and by that, we also don't need to include it in the totalizer for the other objective. That's essentially the idea. And um, we only add literals to the totalizer for the decreasing objective once they become active for the increasing objective. Uh, by that, also lazily incrementally building the totalizer for the decreasing objective, which does nothing for the decision rule instances because the objectives are not overlapping. However, um, for the set covering instances, the objectives are overlapping, and now that doesn't look promising yet. However, this is where we see the performance improvement on these set covering SC instances um, that we've seen over P minimal earlier, mainly. So from this refinement is where we get most of the advantage over P minimal on these types of instances. Why these two different types of set covering instances react so differently to these refinements, we don't fully understand. Um, essentially, the SC instances are probably just hard, or they are definitely harder in general. So probably that's why the refinement does more. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Yeah. Well, with this, I'm at the end of my talk. I've presented our biopsych algorithm, which uh, enables us to enumerate Pareto optimal solutions of CNFs under two objectives. We have an open source implementation that if you're interested, that's behind this link are links to everything related to this talk. Um, we have performed three competitors, even though I didn't talk about the two bad ones today. Um, and the hybrid variant is actually quite interesting, I think, as well, and what performs the best from what we tried. Well, thank you. What about the implicit hitting set instead of Corey added? Would it make sense? Instead of Corey. Enumeration would work. My first thought. Um, but without enumeration. Why would it happen? If you have different assignments to your, you might have different hitting sets with the same cost that, well, you would also need to enumerate over the, over the hitting sets. You can't just enumerate in the subs order. That's what I mean. You might, have, you might have multiple solutions um, corresponding to the same hitting set, but you also might have multiple hitting sets with the same cost. Uh, but other than that, I think we've somewhat started from there, actually. Like a very early version was somewhat hacked into max HS. And then we ended up not even using it anymore. Um, possible, I think. So what happens to the it thinks it's all random following the rest of the right? Well, the, your, your restrictions, your constraints on this minimized ink will only get tighter. So you're never invalidating cores. All cores that you found before yeah. still remain valid. You might have, you will hopefully have new cores. Uh, you are probably guaranteed to have new cores uh, that you're not hitting yet. Um, so you just 
extract new cores until yeah. you find a new reading set that actually solves it, it hits everything. You're not guaranteed that you write the new cores that you actually might spend time in well, not break so much. You might spend time in numerating cores that you implicitly hit already, but now you're spending the one. Maybe. But we also have this new constraint. So yeah, so you can enumerate new cores, sure. But do we have a hand would we have a handle on that? Because those are the ones we would wind to. And we find cores that we already hit. Yes. Well, at least not with our current hitting set. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, the seesaw is a very weird hitting set, something on two objectives. That was one of the other competitors that does terribly. Um, and it does worse, but but it's it's not exactly what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. These are trying to solve the whole problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's like you say, seesaw, but seesaw style instantiation. It's more complex. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, it's just. So it's more like generating frameworks. Yes. Okay, thanks.